Artificial intelligence is everywhere. It's in our phones, our watches, our cars. It is in our banks, deciding on our loans. In Netflix, deciding what we watch. Spotify, deciding what we see, what we hear, sorry. And in Amazon, deciding what we buy. Artificial intelligence is even in beauty contests. In fact, at the first beauty contest, where an AI judged the pictures and decided about the most beautiful person in the world, the results were quite interesting. All winners were white, in all age groups. <laughs> Not a single person of color made it to the finals. Now you may think, who cares about beauty contest? Were you absolutely right? But AI is also in facial recognition software that is sold to law enforcement agencies. And in the United States, for example, the police is using this kind of facial recognition softwares. As revealed by an MIT Media Lab researcher, Joy Bulamwini, these facial recognition softwares perform very badly or very poorly on people with dark skins. In a video she called the coded gaze, she demonstrates how the same camera is able to recognize the face of her colleague, but not hers. The only way the camera would recognize her face is putting on a white mask. After publishing her findings and contacting, uh, contacting camera uh, producers, Joy heard sentences like, well, the algorithms are not racist. Your skin is just too dark. <laughs> yes. So why is it that the camera was able to recognize Joy's colleague's face, but not hers? The answer is actually quite simple. It's because the facial recognition software was not trained to recognize dark skins. The algorithm was not trained with enough pictures of dark-skinned people and no person of color tested it. And if the answer is that easy, was it done on purpose? Well, obviously not. It was not done on purpose. Here, of course, uh, racism is a reality, but here we're talking about unconscious bias. The person who developed this software, probably a white, young, male computer scientist, in a hoodie, developed it and tested it, and it was working. And the quality manager, eventually a white male, confirmed its proper function. So for them, everything was fine. For them. Now, let's have a look at something that is relevant to all of us. Searching for jobs. In 2015, a major tech firm realized that their internal job search engine was recommending highly paid jobs only to men. So how did that happen? Well, you know, we have a gender pay gap, and women usually earn around 22% less than men for the same jobs. Plus, men usually have the higher and the more powerful positions with the higher income. So the system that learned from historical data was magnifying the problem by suggesting well-paid jobs only to male. Unfortunately, this is our problem. We have an exclusive, homogeneous group developing AI for all. Only 12% of the population are involved in the development of AI. And of that 12%, even in the major tech firms, around 12% are female and less than 4% are racially diverse. So if the marginal groups are not included in the development of the AI, their interests cannot be considered. We are a diverse world, and we need solutions to serve that diversity. And we need to do it now. Because I believe if we don't react now, there will be no way back. So let me tell you a story. 
I was born in Morocco with an open mindset, a desire to travel and learn. I studied telecommunications engineering in Spain. Then I stayed there developing hardware for some years. By May 2009, I had graduated my master's degree in Berlin and was now fluent in seven languages. It was in the middle of the financial crisis. I started applying for jobs, dozens and dozens of jobs. No reaction to my applications. I couldn't believe it. I visited job fairs for graduates and talks with many recruiters. My profile seemed to be perfect. Everyone was excited to have someone with my education and experience. Still, to get the job, I had to go through the automated online application process, which I did. No reaction. You can feel my frustration, my struggle and powerlessness. Theoretically, the perfect profile everybody was looking for, but the reality was very different. Months went by, my classmates were getting jobs despite the crisis, and still no reaction to my applications. So with no, with no luck to, in Germany, I moved to China, where I did get a job at the Shanghai World Expo, leading the operations of two Spanish pavilions. And funnily enough, I met my now German husband in China. <laughs> so uh, if someone is missing a partner, go to China. <laughs> you have a good chance. <laughs> OK, so um, two years later, I was back in Berlin and starting my new job as a project manager at Deutsche Telekom. Very quickly, I got engaged in the Women Network. And after a couple of years, I was able to build a strong network uh, within the company. This enables me to make things happen that I believe in. For instance, last year, in May last year, we organized a tech meetup for women in AI. Since Mujan Asghari, it's the co-founder of Women in AI, was in town. Our goal with it was to gather women who work in the field to foster exchange and to grow the network. We were overwhelmed by the participation. The event was sold out. When we were setting it up, we were worried not to get enough participants. We were wrong. This is the group. That night, we brainstormed about further steps. And this is how the idea of an AI hackathon only for women was born. I thought the idea was great. So I activated my network at Telecom. And very quickly, I had four financial sponsors and 30 colleagues volunteering to organize the event. Six months later, the big day arrived, and we had 52 hackers from five countries and a five-month-old baby. You see him in the middle. <laughs> yeah, these days, you've got to start recruiting data scientists very early. <laughs> and he's part of the winning team, so his mom, a very, very intelligent data scientist, um, they, they, won, they won the hackathon, and they developed a solution to de-bias the recruiting process. So it consisted in three parts. The first part um, was around de-biasing the applications, so the job applications. Then de-biasing the applications of the, um, of the candidates. The first was the job descriptions, not applications. And then the third part, they built a diversity engine to create transparency on the diversity of the existing team and how that diversity changes depending who you hire. So I was not part of the jury, but obviously I was very happy the team won. <clears throat> and now I'm working on getting this solution implemented. Why? Well, not only because I believe this is right, but because I don't want other people to go through the same struggle I went through 10 years ago. So we need to build an AI to serve human dignity at its core. And for that to happen, we need to make it unbiased. And for that to happen, we need everyone to be concerned in order to be involved. So I hope that now you are concerned. The next step is how to get involved. 
We need computer scientists, data scientists, who think twice about what they are building, who consider that people different from them will also be using those solutions. We need lawyers who establish the right rules and regulations to serve human dignity and not commercial interests. We need lawyers who consider the less privileged in the discussions and, do, and to make sure they are treated fairly. We need psychologists to help us build the proper human-machine interaction. We need sociologists who help us analyze the patterns of our social relationships that are affected by AI, who help the developers see the strange in the familiar and who help them build an inclusive solution. We need philosophers, anthropologists, to talk about the ethical aspects of AI and how they are impacting our human culture. Technology has been dissociating us from humanities for the last century. It's the time for humanities to rise again. Last year, I started giving talks about AI for everyone, where I explain the basic methodologies of AI using simple pictures of cats and dogs and situations of our daily lives. My goal is to demystify AI and to democratize it. I believe AI is not only for data scientists, it is for everyone. So what started as a knowledge exchange uh, a fun exercise has now turned to be a mission. <laughs> and my plea is, diversity is crucial to build a good AI. Everyone is part of this game. You are part of this game. You can do something about it. And the time to do it is now. Fortunately, I'm seeing great things happening already. So remember the, the beauty contest I mentioned at the beginning? And the second edition, they featured one person of color and 10 Asians. So <laughs> it's a start. And Joy, the MIT researcher, she built a platform to enable people make selfies and upload them to be used in databases that are uh, used to train the algorithms for facial recognition. And even the big players. So take, for instance, IBM. They built a diversity detector toolkit, so it's a bias detector, let's say, and it helps detect AI bias and recommends adjustments. And even Facebook and Google are working on similar solutions. So there is hope. And my dream today is that we all together build an AI, a future AI that is for and not against human dignity. Thank you. <laughs>